Hello, my name is uh, Kelly Harlton. I'm uh, one of Morris Kohansky's uh, students and, uh, and uh, assistant uh, survival instructors and outdoor skills instructors. Uh, the project we have here for you today is we're going to uh, build a, a buck saw, which is one of the projects that we do very often on our courses. So here I've selected a tree that from every angle I've looked at it, it's relatively straight. And I've today picked on a, on a pine tree. We can use lots of things, but the pine and spruce seem to seem to be uh, one of our favorite materials. Uh, strong and dries nice and light. So the saw uh, project is pretty simple. All we need is a suitable straight tree. A saw blade, of course, which can be lightly carried in your pack or rolled up into a tin can or it can be fashioned into a belt. So that's some of the ways people favor on carrying that. Some thin twine with multiple wraps or some thicker uh, cordage we're going to use to tension the saw and some uh, nuts and bolts, or in this case I'm just using a couple of uh, screws, which seems to work passably well. So step one is we're going to cut some sections out of this puppy. Two elbow to fingertip lengths. Cut off a little crooked section here. And then another section that we'll probably trim later, just something slightly longer than the saw blade itself. I'm going to take the bark off this puppy, and there's two reasons for this. The main one is that. It will be much lighter when it dries, a lot more aesthetic, of course. This will be the most painful thing you'll have to watch. Well, it'll be edited probably. But uh, once pe people see that you, you know, you can cut down this portion to to uh, a quarter of actual time or a tenth of actual time. Or fast forward. <laughs> or or you talk about uh, knife use and knife yeah. skills and how you expect your knife yeah, so to be configured that that it does. Inertia is your friend to some of the little knots and tight bits. Yeah, the, the motion that causes you to develop the, the inertia or the impetus to go through, the, through where the branches were yeah. and, and stuff like that. Black spruce walking staff. When I was in good form, I could peel it with my knife in less than 60 seconds. It's so a walking staff that uh, you know uh, fulfills all the requirements of of uh, thickness and length of a scout staff. It should be as a minimal graduating skill development. An instructor should be able to peel such a stick in less than 60 seconds cleaner than a student who takes 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And which depends on the configuration of the knife. The Scandi dry, dry, grind lends itself to working very well as a peeler. Here's
the next thing we want to do is we want to examine them and see if they've got any natural curvature to them. These are pretty straight, actually. Yeah, I usually roll them together till I get the biggest gap. Yeah. Sure. And then that way you're, you're it's because that uh, any type of irregularity in that regard, if it's not kept in the plane of right. the construction, it wants to uh, collapse. So you got to pay attention to that issue. If the uh, if you put the saw together with the biggest gap between the two sticks facing each other, that's the most stable. Right. So and it's if it's if it's sideways, it's partially stable. But if you get those crooks with the uh, uh, the the bend to the outside of the saw, it just flips apart. <laughs> Again. Uh, we wanted to point out to the audience uh, that uh, you work all these things out by building a dozen. And here you can see the, the um, uh, what do you call it, uh, resourcefulness of using parts of the saw itself <laughs> as a baton to help in the construction. So having lined that up in, li in, uh, in the uh, issue of the biggest gap between the sticks will give you the greatest stability. The uh, notch, of course, uh, as you use the saw, there's a pin on the ends of each blade and you find it wants to work off the end of the stick, so you have to create a little V-notch in there to cradle uh, the pin so it stays where it belongs. And of course, you don't know where that notch goes until you have made the split where the blade goes. So you'll see that there's also a sequence of, there, there's always an order of how you do things. First things have to come first. And, uh, one of the biggest, uh, uh, depending on uh, or what you use, if you're using a bolt, it's one thing. The uh, once you uh, have uh, set the blade with the bolt in the little hole, then after that you find that as your attention is diverted, so some other part of the, the screw often falls out. So you often, sometimes, use a tie it or or you you uh, you know do something so that it, like the bolt has fallen out on Kelly as he was working and <laughs> so you see that the attention to one thing will cause something to come apart at the other and and you've got to uh, uh, devote some means to deal with that I mean it's something that plagues you and you uh, realize so now the question is now now you need a magnet to find the <laughs> bolt that has fallen out there. Now we often have a a, a, nut, a screw with a nut in it, and when we put those together, we nip the thread of the nut so that the nut doesn't unscrew itself and get lost. But you don't nip the mangle the thread of the nut so much that you can't unscrew it. Uh, but usually, you nip it enough that with effort it takes some effort to uh, unscrew it with your with your fingers. With this style of box that we're doing here, this is crucial. So I'm going to put a, a 90 degree angle here and it has to, the reason I mounted the saw blade first is because I need something very specific to aim for. Right. So I'm not going to reduce the, uh, the diameter of the stick at all, so it's going to have its full strength. That's one of its advantages. Yeah, so I'm going to cut, do my best to cut a 90. So the Which way seems the, to be an easy angle to cut for most people. Yeah, so he's, he's, uh, I guess there must be, I call that a knife edge, uh, for want of a better term, where you, uh, uh, it's one of the carving operations that uh, in log cabin building, there might be a term where he's uh, creating a, a situation where when you put the long part in, that it's engaged in such a way that it stays where it's put. So using the split as the alignment, you 
you, uh, you you trim off, but not enough to weaken the stick. Because the moment you start doing fancy things <laughs> and notches, and when you tension the blade, you'll discover that you won't be happy with, uh, with the way the wood bends or breaks. So everything you do is sort of saying, well, I need to do this, but I don't want to compromise the, the springiness or the strength of the components. Got a little tug just to set that again. Got to make sure all the slack is out so that when you put the other piece and you take a measure that you don't that you don't discover that it's too short or too long. You want to that have ready? it that it's uh, it's yeah, you it's can uh, you can tolerate uh, in the area, in the interests of uh, stability, if the ends go inward a little bit, it's not a problem. But if they go outward, that is, the other end of the uprights is spread longer than the blade, again, you'll find an instability. Things want to, want to hear a precise cut of length. Uh, it's kind of a, an anomaly where a person's using a saw to make a saw. <laughs> You can always use this with the rag wrapped around it. Hey, hey. So the so the issue is that uh, uh, you may have a crafting saw. If you can imagine that saw uh, that uh, Kelly is using is only four fingers long, you might find that it's astoundingly useful, and it's about the size of a jackknife in your pocket. But then that's another story. It's about preferences. The, uh, there's ways of of making the cut we use the saw to speed up the so this again if it's got any kind of a curve or bend you want it in the same plane or orientation yeah the same the plane, plane not, not instability so either the bow goes up or the bow go usually goes up uh, in this instant in plane with the with the whole saw frame but um, uh, to give more space between the blade and where you put it and generally in my I favor putting that not in the middle as much as maybe uh, two thirds away from the blade to give more. And, and here we're preparing the, the end to uh, engage the uprights. So by narrowing it, then you can cut a, and cut a end, knock, end notch. And I guess uh, uh, you see Kelly is sighting because both ends have to be precisely oriented in line with each other. So by making a lot of these saws, you, you tend to develop uh, uh, an ability to, to cut to the chase and build something efficiently, effectively, and fast. Uh, but, but that doesn't come without repetition and practice. An awful lot of artifacts that we make uh, in the forest uh, require considerable carpentry skills, and we aren't born with these things naturally. So then we're going to cut a V notch in the end of this puppy. Now, it can be appreciated that you could have devices. I think that if you took copper pipe or tubing and you treat it in the right way, you would slide that on the end of each of the sticks there. Oh. And I'm working on that. So your blade, your two pins, the tensioning string, and those two little devices would go all work together to uh, save on this type of uh, you see the V-notch on the end of the stick and to engage degrees, the upright. For some reason, 90 degrees, people can do 90 right. degrees, but that's important that it dresses right. that so well. It's, uh, it's got to uh, 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 different, uh, different people have their own favorite ways of going about this. The, some, some more stable than others. And of course, it, um, 
It goes without saying that uh, uh, the first thing, the first skill that you tend to acquire, that type of operation you see there, carelessly done. Usually can uh, result in a cut to the knuckles of the holding hand. <laughs> things like that, so you have to develop a method of making complex cuts that don't compromise your safety. You can check to see how it dresses and how it. Now in one way of building this saw, you could build two of these that you have just done and then configurate them in a triangle. And the complexity of the situation can drive you nuts. In this case, Kelly is, uh, in order for any type of device to be rigid, whether it's a bridge or a, or a kite or, or a buck saw, it has to have triangles in, in it usually. Uh, usually a triangle is the easy way to go. So the circumstance here is that, that if you can't make a triangle out of sticks, you make the triangle out of string. And then the, uh, the, uh, the rigidity is thereby. So our paracord's a li little bit elastic, so we can sa if we can sacrifice some strength and pull out the the uh, current out of the mantle of the paracord, just so that it's not so elast elasticy. Often we'll use some um, finer uh, twine that has little or no stretch. In this case, paracord, what, is, uh, what I happen to have on my person, so that's yeah. what I'm going to use. Yeah, para, paracord, uh, which we affectionately call 550-200, tensile strength of 550 pounds and a safe working load of uh, 200 pounds, um, that uh, if you're building the saw, there are many applications where you want no elasticity. And the issue here that if you create a tension uh, by, by what I call parbuckling or twisting, uh, you find that elasticity invites some kind of a spectacular injury. <laughs> and the spectacular injury in this case is you're asking yourself, can I knock out a tooth or can I knock out an eyeball? So when you're working with an elastic cord, you, uh, you find that as you wind it up, the kinetic energy, just like winding up an elastic motor on a model airplane, it'll build up enough power that should a break occur, uh, that there are a variety of ways where, where uh, injury can occur. So if you're packing a kit for building the saw, the blade, the bolts that go on the ends, and the cord that you purposely carry may be non-elastic. Now, if you're using an elastic cord, and paracord is a universally available, one of the more astounding uh, substances to pack in your kit, uh, you can use it too, but you have to factor in its elasticity and know uh, how to handle it so that uh, you don't have uh, uh, something breaking unexpectedly and then the elasticity of the cord um, takes a piece of broken something or other and, and uh, hurts you in some way. You know, it, it's a sad thing if you, if you lose the sight of one eye because you didn't understand. The Kelly is dressing down a, a piece of suitably strong wood to wind up the strings and they will be wound up until the proper tension holds the whole saw together. So the stick can't be too weak or else as you wind it, it'll break. And it can't be too cumbersome because then it'll uh, haunt you all the time you're using the saw. So you sort of always find that there is a kind of a, a parameter, a limit to everything. Um, the, uh, you know, things can be too heavy or too light, too long or too short, too uh, brittle or too soft, or and, and so you've experience uh, guides you and eliminates a lot of these sort of uh, uh, variables.
So Kelly is configurating the, the strings in such a way that when the tension is wound up on the strings, that the triangular arrangement he has made will, uh, which is, this is the point where when I saw um, uh, Kelly doing this, I sort of, well, I could, uh, maybe I'll go so far as to say that I, uh, back of the burner somewhere, <laughs> I thought this was possible, but I never got around to doing it. And I might even say, gee, I wish I'd done this before somebody like Kelly <laughs> got <laughs> took the opportunity and uh, and um, uh, worked out this approach. Because uh, making two brace sticks opens up a certain kettle of fish that that uh, can drive you crazy, whereas tensioning up the, the saw reduces the weight and perhaps gives you an alternative which is uh, a lot easier to manage for the non-carpenter amongst us. Maybe a sailor would tend to make. So by tensioning these these cords in that fashion you see there the the triangular arrangement gives us the rigidity that we seek. So one of the ideas of going with this sort of uh, concave and convex V-notches is that uh, we can untension the saw and this now can slide up and down. So if we want to apply more attention to the saw blade, we can have this lower and have more leverage. Or if we need to cut a bigger tree, yeah. we can actually slide this up. As if you wanted a more, a more throat, it's obvious that at this stage, Kelly could use a, a baton and drive the the, uh, the, the middle brace uh, to give a, a deeper throat right. in, the, in the saw. And, uh, and you end up having a matter of fact, demonstrate that a little bit, show people what we're meaning is that well, once the, uh, the tension is there, yeah, you um, can move this up or down as required. Yeah. And if if your notches don't dress perfectly, you run the risk of creating a split. But you can, and if you're nervous about that, or if you see signs and signals, then by all means you can put a lashing or constrictor knot or yeah, something a constrictor to prevent there. the. Uh, so this probably weighs. Um, oh boy, that's got to be ten pounds at least, ten or fifteen. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Well, in, in a few days it would be uh, half that. Fraction, <laughs> yeah, the, half the, then, the green sticks. And then in a month it'll be maybe about two, you know, two or three pounds. Be, if you're, you'll find that when a peeled stick will dry remarkably fast in the winter. So <coughs> when you contemplate making the saw, the very first thing is you get yourself the, the wood, peel it, and then uh, maybe a few hours later when you put the saw together, you find that uh, your, your sticks have lost a significant amount of weight. And there you go, the, the Kelly the rush variation <laughs> of... Uh, this is a half-day project for us in the classroom, so we uh, cleaned up nice. All our edges would be beveled to prevent splits. Um, we would probably have notches where the strings sit and maybe carve decorative um, tighteners. So there's lots you can do to make this. This is carrying a saw and you need a you need something that can cut a hug size tree down for the night and you don't want to spend more than 15 or 20 minutes yeah. uh, putting your frame together. Yeah, yeah the, uh, you can appreciate that in a, in, in, in a, in a program of instruction that uh, the saw prevent, uh, presents uh, the simpler knife skill operations. So you kill two birds with one stone. So the student that shows up on a course has yet to learn how to use a knife safely and skillfully begins the process of, uh, of uh, uh, manip you know, using the knife under the supervision of a knowledgeable instructor. So the peeling and the, the splitting, the trimming, 
the making of the the end notches, all those sort of things could be focused on in the area of knife skill development and next thing you know. So when you arrive on the scene of a, of a program, you've got all your students, generally the very first thing I make is the buck saw because we're going to have to go and harvest firewood and everything. And then once the buck saw is built, then we do other things. But usually I've discovered in my mature old age that the smartest thing I ever do is the moment the students arrive, short of the amount of safety knowledge and knife use, the buxars are built. <coughs> and then for the next week, the rest of the week, we run five-day courses here at uh, Karamat. Uh, the rest of the courses, the saw is available for, for gathering firewood, for crafting, for whatever. And there are a number of artifacts. Uh, one being the stat, walking staff, two, the saw, three, the Roycraft pack frame, four, the ski shoe. All of those sort of things are the artifacts that have to be built that use a knife and use a bit of string and straight sticks.